Every race, and this is important that people get this, especially young people, every race, with no exception, has contributed to the civilization that we live in today. The black man has contributed. Don't think he hasn't. He's made magnificent contributions. In spite of the uphill fight these people have had to take because of their dark skins, there's even some archaeological evidence that they were among the first people to make iron. That coffee you drank this morning, my favorite drink, was a gift to those people, the black race. I don't know how the Indians got along without it. Do you know who invented blood transfusion? A black man invented blood transfusion. That man saved thousands of lives, maybe millions of lives. But how many people know that a black man invented that? Do you know how he died? They say he died, he got in an automobile accident, lost a lot of blood, was rushed to a hospital, and they wouldn't let him in because they said he was a nigger. And he bled to death. The yellow race has made great contributions to this civilization. Their culture was very ancient. The white man has made wonderful contributions, and so have the red men of America, the Indian. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has the right to say to any other people, this is my civilization. Everybody has the right to say this is our civilization. It's like a big kettle of stew. It doesn't just have onions in that stew to make it taste good. There are many things in that stew, gifts of every race in the world to make it what it is today, our present day civilization. Now when I was a little boy going to school, a long, long time ago, I hate to think of how many years ago, at that time they taught very little about Indians in school. But sadly at that time, always bad, always. Well I remember it. I remember that fat ugly old teacher. Her name was Miss Gillespie. I don't remember learning any reading and writing arithmetic from her, but I do remember three statements she had to say about Indians. Is she serious? The only good Indian is a dead Indian. Indians are inferior to white people, both physically and mentally. Indians are like little children. They never think of the future. They just live from day to day without one thought of what's going to happen tomorrow. And I take a look at what the white man has done to this once beautiful land in the short time he's been here, and he can tell that to children at school, think about it. I became a teacher too, a science teacher. It takes from 300 to 10,000 years, that long, depending upon the location, for one little inch of topsoil to form. Some parts of the Midwest, a short time, the white man has been there a little over 100 some years, that little while. 18 inches are washed down into the Gulf of Mexico. And they wonder why they have floods every year in the Mississippi, Missouri, Platte River Valley. Why the idiots strip the earth of all its protection. And they needn't blame it on that big population. The minute they landed on Plymouth Rock, they skinned our Mother Earth like you skin a muskrat, without one thought of the future. Anyone with any intelligence knows you don't cut trees down the side of a hill or a mountain like they did next door to me. But for that precious dollar bill they worship so much, they stripped those beautiful forests in California along the coast, and what happened right afterwards? The mud floods started covering their fancy houses. Did they learn anything? No. Money first always right through California, Oregon, Washington, probably now Alaska. Where the cones used to hang from the trees? Used to be thousands of cones hanging from those trees. What happened to them? Why are our trees sick and dying? Acid rain. So what do the big brains do in the government? They have a study, and another study, and another study. And meanwhile, our mother earth is sick and dying. I'm living here where I can see what's happening. They continue to have these studies, and meanwhile our earth is sick. Do you realize the millions of animals and birds that depend on those cones and seeds to feed their little ones to survive? Oh yes, they say acid rain kills fish. They say no more, certainly it kills fish. And when the fish go, the mink, the otter, the loon, the blue heron, the fish hawk, the kingfisher, they go too. They have super salesmen coming around to all these little communities. Loon Lake, Vermontville, Merrillsville, Bloomingdale, Paul Smith, selling some kind of a chemical poison that's supposed to kill black flies. Out of curiosity, I went over the other side of that mountain to a little place called Vermontville to see what this fellow had to say. Little fat stubby guy with a fancy suit, driving a big Cadillac car, big talker. Goes on and on about this wonderful product his company turns out that kills black flies. Funny, after a while he says, any questions? I says, yes, I have a question. What is it? Does it kill other insects? Oh, how he hates to answer that question. Talks all around my question. Finally, after 10 minutes, I said, Mister, I hate to interrupt you, but you haven't answered my question. Does it kill other insects? Yes, next question before I could say a word. Dave Fayak, who used to live up here in Anchiota, raised bees. 
wanted to know if it, if it killed these. The same runaround. Finally, after a while, I said, look, he'd like to know, so would I. Does it kill these? Yes. Next question. I says, wait a minute. What are you fools trying to play God for? Every time you try to play God, you hurt this earth a little bit more. You take the future of our children away from them. If this kill, if no other reason, the black fly is very valuable. Do you know why? To keep you butchers out of the woods here. It won't kill every bird and animal there is. And if this kills a useful bug like a bee, how are we going to have any more pollination? How are we going to have any more apples, strawberries, cherry, chokesberries, raspberries, huckleberries, blueberries, and a thousand other plants? And if this kills all insects, what are the birds supposed to eat? What are the fish supposed to eat? What are the frogs, the toads, the salamanders, the bar darning needles, and the million other creatures supposed to eat? And when they die, what are the things supposed to eat to live on them and ride on up the line? I wasted my breath. Big fat lady got up. She says, we don't care about the birds and the fish. We don't want our kids to be bitten with black flies. I says, you continue to do these things and you will destroy the future of your own children. It's that close. They spread their poison. I haven't heard a whipper will since. Wiped them right out. Used to see flocks of cedar waxwing, 60, 70, 80 in a flock. Last three years I've seen 14. This year I've seen three. Half our birds are gone, half our animals are gone, and the rest are sick and dying. And I'm living where I can see what, hap what is happening, and it scares me. And it also angers me. And I could go on and on and on on what the white man is doing to this once beautiful country, and not only this country, but all the way around the world, for that thing they worship so much, that dollar bill. But that teacher did say this. She said the American Indians gave corn to the world, and that was it, as if that's the only thing the Indians ever gave. Well, not only did the American Indian give corn to the world, do you know how many kinds of corn they developed all together? All together, the American Indians developed over 300 different kinds of corn. Over 300 kinds. Even that so-called hybrid corn, the white man boasts who had just discovered the last few years how to have corn, that was known by our Indians in Mexico a thousand years ago. All of the beans in the entire world came from the American Indian, except for two, horse and soybean, they came from China. Even that famous dish you hear so much about, Boston baked beans, was a Wampanoag Indian dish taught to the pilgrims by the Wampanoag Indians. And that was the first time that white folks enjoyed several dishes we enjoy today. Clam chowder, oyster stew, pumpkin pie, believe it or not, cranberry sauce, corn soup, popcorn, all of our corn, our beans, pumpkin, squash, celery, buckwheat, maple sugar, maple syrup, vanilla, chocolate, peppers, tapioca, <laughs> iris potato. That's right, it didn't come from Ireland like everyone thinks. It saved the Irish people, yes, it saved the people of the world, but it was a gift of the American Indian. And that nation of Indians that developed the Irish potato and gave it to the world, you know how many kinds they had? According to the National Geographic magazine, they had over 79 different varieties of Irish potatoes. Sweet potatoes is another gift of the American Indians of the world. And the young people in this country ought to be interested. Even penis, popcorn, and chewing gum were gifts of the American Indian. Pineapple didn't come from Hawaii. Pineapple came from our Central American Indians, which brought over to Hawaii. Tapioca didn't come from Africa. It came from our South American Indians, which was brought over to Africa. As a matter of fact, according to agricultural scientists, American Indian food plants show a further development from their wild prototypes, that means the plants they originally came from, than do the food plants of Europe, Africa, or Asia. Take, for instance, peppers and tomatoes, both the gift of the Indians to the world. Now, these two plants belong to a deadly poison family, the nightshade family. The same plant grew in a wild state across the ocean, yet they never took that plant over there and made it into one good to eat, but our Indians did. And when they offered it to the Spaniards for the first time to eat, do you know what the Spaniards thought? They thought they were trying to poison them. <laughs> Today, the whole world eats peppers and tomatoes. But I bet my shirt that not one person, 10,000, know where they came from, that they came from this land and they were gifts of the American Indian. According to the Museum of Arts and Science in Rochester, and that's one of the best scientific museums in this country, one nation of Indians, the Inca Indians of Peru, originated, developed, and gave to the world more agricultural food plants now in use today than all the European peoples put together. Think of it, all of them put together. French, Scotch, Irish, Russians, German, Polish, Italian, Czechs, all of them combined, didn't give as much as that one Indian nation did. Now, if that isn't a wonderful gift to today's civilization, I'd like to know what is. 
And why they don't put these things in their school books when they're studying about Indians, I'd like to know why not also. It wasn't just agricultural food plants that the Indians gave the world. What, look at the medicines that came from the American Indian. What would we have done without quinine and Indian medicine? We might not have built the Panama Canal or won World War I. Quinine is one of many medicines we use today gifts to the American Indian. There's quinine, curare, say the baby, and according to Ripley, believe it or not, the first iodine and aspirin were American Indian medicines. In the 400 years that white men have dominated these two continents, they haven't discovered one, not even one medicine plant that wasn't known by Indians. Even that shirt you got on, it's probably made out of cotton. If it is, it's American Indian cotton. That's right, with a foreign name Egyptian attached to it. Don't ask me why. There's 20 or 30 Indian gifts to the world with European or other foreign names attached to them. Very misleading. Like Egyptian cotton, Irish potato, Turkey tobacco, India rubber, Italian beans, Jerusalem artichoke, or Turkey itself, none of which came from across the ocean. It's true the Egyptians did have a cotton. A short fibered crude cotton, I doubt if it's grown commercially anywhere in the world today. No cotton in the entire world had longer or finer fiber than the kind the American Indians developed and gave the world. Do you know what the white man thought it was when they first saw cloth made from it? It was that fine they thought it was silk. Today it's not only grown here in America, it's grown all over the world, along with the best, the longest stable cotton developed by any people, called South Sea Island cotton, also a gift of the American Indian. Even the government of the United States of America, actually in many ways, is patterned after the government of the Iroquois Confederacy. The white man across the ocean never had a true democracy. They'll take a magnifying glass and they will desperately, frantically, and vainly look all over the European history to try to find just one democracy, just one, to make good that claim. And they'll come up with this. I got in school, you got in school, my grandchildren will get in school unless they start teaching the truth for a change. They'll say this, the ancient Greeks had a democracy. Doesn't that sound familiar? They, they'll say the ancient Greeks discovered democracy. Well, I, I, I studied that so-called Greek democracy. If that's a democracy, I live on the moon. Over half of them were slaves with no voice at all. Hey, wait a minute. Any country that has slavery, and that includes the United States when they started, is not a pure democracy. And I'll never understand why they connect George Washington and Thomas Jefferson with liberty, freedom, equality, democracy. Are they blind or plain stupid? Washington, they say, had over 400 slaves. Jefferson had the same number of slaves. The Iroquois outlawed slavery in all of their territory. And at one time their territory was as great as the Roman Empire at its greatest height. Furthermore, in ancient Greece, your mother, your wife, your sister, your daughter wouldn't have a voice. Nor would they have a voice anywhere in Europe. Women were considered chattel of property. So how in the name of heavens can they call the Greek government or any European government a democracy when one half of them were eliminated because they were women? In my own lifetime, and I'm not a hundred years old yet, I can remember myself when not one white nation in the entire world gave their women a voice. I can remember that. The first one across there to give their women a voice was New Guinea, north of Australia. And I'm not sure you'd call them white. Three-fourths of them are dark. The first one in Europe was England just before World War I. The United States right after World War I. Spain gave their women a voice 30-some years ago. I thought Switzerland gave their women a voice. But last month they were, there was a Swiss tourist that came here and he sat right on that bench and I asked him about it. Oh, he said it didn't pass in all of our states. And guess what little white country last year, as late as that, finally gave their women a voice. Liechtenstein. The Iroquois, and not only the Iroquois, but most of these Indian people under them, not only gave their women a voice, they gave them far more rights than white women possess today in this country, America. Contrary to the big lie that was slapped into my face when I was a little boy going to school, how Indians treat their women, believe me, white women in this country would envy the rights of Iroquois women. Many like to say that great Magna Carta of England has something to do with freedom and democracy. Every once in a while that'll pop up, the Magna Carta. Have you ever studied it? The people aren't even mentioned. Gave the nobles, the barons, a little voice, and not much of a voice. The great mass of people all over Europe in those days, including England, were serfs, little better than slaves. And guess who those nobles and barons were? They were little kings themselves. I have a suspicion, it's my own theory, I could be wrong, but I'll bet I'm not, 
that what political reform England got, she probably was directly influenced by the French Revolution. For good reason. Those nobles in England would have lost their heads as those nobles in France did if they didn't start thinking about their people for a change. They must have realized it. Freedom is very contagious once it gets started, especially among an oppressed people. So as European whites were for generations, for centuries, under their dictators, their kings, their Caesars, their czars, their popes, their emperors. And where do you suppose the French got their idea of freedom and democracy? From right over here, the American Revolution, from men like General Lafayette and the French soldiers he brought <coughs> over here during the Revolutionary War to help the Americans. And where do you suppose the Americans got their idea of freedom and democracy? From the American Indian, especially the Iroquois, a very famous lawyer by the name of Felix Cohen, worked in the Interior Department at Washington for a number of years, has written books on law. In fact, he was considered one of the greatest authorities on the subject in the entire world. I always felt very lucky to have known him. He had a camp right over here in Lake Clear, 10 miles away. He stood right there in the floor, showed me a photostat copy of a report given by three British spies who were sent over here to America just before the Revolutionary War to find out why the colonies were so rebellious against their mother country. And it was their report to their superiors back home in England. And believe me, it was interesting reading. It was worded something like this. The Aborigine of America, meaning the Indian, are a strange people with peculiar customs and ways very different from ours in Europe. Why, the people actually elect their own leaders. And if the leaders do not abide by the will of the people, they're removed from office. And this is a serious and a dangerous thing. This is contagious. Our American colonies are now demanding a voice in the government. Something's got to be done about this immediately. I read the report. Now, why they don't put these things in their school books when they study about Indians, I'll never know. I'll tell you something. You'd find the truth about the old Indian. Far more interesting, educational, and instructive than the garbage. And I mean dirty garbage with a capital and underline. They have been brainwashing the minds of people, especially children, about Indians for over 200 years. Now, I'm going to explain that government to you briefly. There's a diagram of it. Each one of these rectangles the white man called the tribe was actually a state. And they who sit in the council house they call chiefs. Those chiefs, they weren't like kings and queens and dukes and barons and what have you. The noble system of Europe, whose oldest son across the ocean in Europe, automatically became king, baron, duke when his father died, regardless of what the people wished. Under their systems all over Europe, they inherited the right to rule. Furthermore, it was backed by every one of their religions. As a matter of fact, at one time the church taught that when the king speaks, God speaking through his mouth, you've got to obey him. Those chiefs simply represented their clans. And since everybody belonged to a clan in plain English, they represented their people, were put in office by their people to represent them and their government. That was unknown by white men, at least it wasn't practiced by them before it came to this land. There was only one other people across the ocean that believed in real democracy, and it was not a white race in Europe. It was a black race in Africa called Ashanti. Now, if those chiefs, if they didn't do as their people wished them to do, after the third warning by the women through their war chief, they were removed from office, replaced by chiefs who would do as their people wished them to do. Furthermore, they could never hold public office again, ever, as long as they lived. That's a democracy. You couldn't do that with a king. He rules by divine right, whatever that means. They have separate state governments whereby they control their internal state affairs. They have a central federal government at the cap of Onondaga where they have two houses, a bill in order to become a law has to go through those two houses. What does that sound like? There's where they got the idea of democracy, not from the land of kings and queens across the ocean. Don't let them kid you. Did you ever see a lacrosse game? It's a North American Indian game. Did you ever watch a hockey game? Hockey's a South American Indian game. It comes from the Indians of Argentina. Did you ever play marbles when you were a kid? You were playing an Indian game, although Europeans also have a type of marble. Today they play both kinds. Did you ever go downhill on a toboggan? That's an Indian invention. Did you ever sit in a hammock? That's an Indian invention. Did you ever sit in a sleeping bag? Did you ever go canoeing, snowshoeing? Northern Indians and Eskimos were the first people to make and use snow goggles. South American Indians were the first people to make and use toothbrushes. Peruvian Indians were the first people to fill cavities and teeth with gold or turquoise, remove tumors from their brain by successful surgical operations. 
I've only mentioned a few of the many gifts of the American Indians to the world, but I say here to you people, and I wouldn't hesitate a minute to bet my life on it any day, that white people in this country, whether they realize it or not, are actually living more the way the Indians lived at the time of Columbus, thinking and governing themselves the way the Indians did at the time of Columbus, eating foods that Indians ate at the time of Columbus, than the Indians living the way the white man did at the time of Columbus. And it's like we had these ever took away the many gifts of the American Indians to the world, believe you me, this civilization we live in today would crumble and crumble mighty fast. And that's why I say such unfair and misleading statements as that missionary article tacked to the wall underneath that corner of that contribution chart. The Indian's old world is disappearing. Whether he likes it or not, he must make the change to the white man's civilization. Such a statement as that, especially in this day and age with people educated as they are and in contact around the world as they are, that statement is not only ridiculous, it's stupid. And it certainly isn't true. The civilization we live in today is made up of the gifts of every race in the world, white, black, yellow, red, brown, and nobody has a right to claim it as their own. It's like a careless steward doesn't just have onions in it, it has many things, gifts of all people. I'm going to add a little bit more to this message because I feel it's very important. I taught in Indian schools for every 25, at least 25 years. And the last place I taught down there, the only reason I moved up here is somebody broke into the museum and I had to come up to protect what's in here. But there was a, a French je a priest on the Canadian side. He says, Ray, come here. I says, yes, what do you want? He says, what are you teaching these Indian children to be proud they're Indians for? I said, say that again? He said, what did the Indians ever do for the world? You could take all the American Indians in the world, you could dump them in the ocean, and you wouldn't know a human being was over here before the white man came. And then he went on to brag about the great Colosseum in Rome that's standing after 2,000 years. I had to interrupt him. I said, yeah, they threw you at the lions, didn't they? And he went on. He says, what did the Indians ever do? I says, what did you have to eat for dinner today? Why? What did you have to eat for dinner? Every single thing he mentioned came from the American Indian. I said, that fancy car wouldn't run without a gift of the Indian. He says, what's that? I says, rubber. I says, the first time white people ever saw rubber, they saw Indians playing a game very similar to basketball. And when that ball came bouncing toward them, they left a record of what they did. They started to run away from it. They thought it was alive. That's the first time white people ever saw rubber. And they weren't just playing a the game. They had practical uses for rubber. They were wearing waterproof clothing. They had rubber boots on. And then I told what I just told you folks, plus a little extra. And said, my advice to you is to go back to school, take a few science courses, and, and get caught up a little bit. You're behind times. Now, out west on the Pine Ridge Reservation, there was a priest, there was a priest called Father Edwards. Entirely different type of a person. He knows better than teaching an Indian child to be ashamed of their own people. Did you ever stop to think how an Indian child feels going to school, sitting there all alone, surrounded by white children? Teacher gets up in front of the whole class and describes that little Indian boy or little Indian girl's grandmothers and grandfathers is dirty, lazy, treacherous cruel, eight or nine other ad bad adjectives, bloodthirsty savages. You ever stop thinking what that does to an Indian kid? Goes to a moving picture show and they're seeing a cowboy and Indian story that makes a hero out of a white man because he shoots Indians. I see what this does to Indian children and it angers me. Now this priest in South Dakota is an educator. He's gone back into the records. Furthermore, he's not afraid to tell what he has found in the records. He said he can prove by the records that the average height of the European white man at the time of Columbus was five foot tall, average height. That one out of every 10 Europeans in those days, due to insufficient diet, lack of proper nutrients, were deformed in some way. It's a big percentage. He said, thanks to what Indian America has given the world in the line of food plants, medicines, ideas of sanitation and health, people today are as healthy and strong as they are. He said, many ideas about health that we take for granted came from Europe, didn't come from Europe at all. They were taught to white man by Indian doctors from this land. Ideas like cleanliness. As a matter of fact, one of the first laws ever passed against Indians was passed by Queen Isabella, forbidding Indians to bathe so much that bathing was very bad for their health. He said, these ideas like cleanliness, fresh air, sunshine, exercise, they learned from American Indian doctors. In those days, if you were sick, you were sort of condemned to death. The Indian 
put in put encouragement into a sick man and made him feel good and he got well. He said, it, he said it would, an eighth grade student in this country, America today, would have a hard time squeezing into a suit of armor of a man who was considered a big man at the time of King Arthur in Europe. He said, in fact, it was the American Indian who put the white men on the map. They have never taught real Indian history and culture in either this country or Canada. Nor have they taught real white man's history and culture in either this country or Canada. There isn't a kid that hasn't heard of the famous pyramids of Egypt, one of the seven wonders of the world. The three large ones and a number of small ones are Mexican Indians, but literally hundreds of them. One or two of them are larger in area than the largest Egypt ever produced, built by Indians. As a matter of fact, the biggest pyramid in the world isn't in America or Egypt, it's in China. They brag about the Great Appian Way of Rome. Have you ever seen it? Were you in the service? A few hundred miles long. Our Inca Indians of Peru built two-lane highways still in use today after thousands of years. They tunnel through mountains. They built suspension bridges over gigantic gorges. One of their roads that was stretched out straight would reach from New York City to Los Angeles would make your Appian Way of Rome look like a cow path. You know they have found archaeological evidence that the Mayan Indians of Yucatan knew the world was round before Christopher Columbus was born. They revolved on its axis and it was a part of the planetary system with the sun at the center, that the entire thing was a part of the stellar system, they could predict not only solar eclipses, but lunar eclipses. That's a wonderful achievement. They invented zero a thousand years before it was independently invented by the Arabs and the Hindus. They knew every bit of modern mathematics we knew today, including calculus. Their calendar was more accurate than the Julian calendar, which all of Europe was using at the time of Columbus. There's even evidence they knew about penicillin. Now, why do they don't they teach these in school? What are, what's the average kid taught in school about Indians? The Indians hunted, they fished, and they killed people. They love to stress killing when it comes to Indians because the Indians try to defend their country against a foreign invader. It's always got to be a war club, a war hoop, a war dance, a war paint, a war this, a war that, a war that, a war this. I'll ask you a question. Who invented germ warfare, chemical warfare, poison gases, bombs, guns, battleships, dynamite, torpedoes, defoliation, insecticide, biological warfare? Who thought of these things to kill other humans? Indians? Before they start throwing mud, they better look in the mirror and see what color looks back at them. And I say it's about time they told the truth. And that's why we have racism in America. Because they do not teach children that this civilization today is not a white man civilization. It's made up of the gifts of all races, each important. It's not my civilization, it's our civilization. And until they teach these gifts of other children, other races to the to young people in this country, until they do that, we're going to have racism in America. And that little innocent five-year-old white kid, you can't get mad at him. He's only five years old. He's going to grow up with a swell head, thinking he's better than everybody else. And that little dark kid is going to grow up feeling very inferior, very hurt. And he's never going to feel a part of this country until they teach the truth. What other races have given to the world? It is not a white man's civilization. It's made up of white, black, yellow, red, brown. And that's my message Anyone that wants to listen, and anyone want to argue with me, come on up here. That's the end of my sermon. <laughs>
and you learn your lessons and we finish early enough, I'll tell you stories about your culture, your traditions, your history. I'll tell you stories about the environment. And on weekends, he would take his students on trips to see what people were doing with their lives. And he said, you can do things like that with your lives as well. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't just because you're Native. He taught his students to be proud of who they were. And when he retired from school teaching, he built a museum in the Adirondack Mountains called the Six Nations Museum. It's still there. It's open in the summertime. And when uh, Ray was directing the museum, he would have us sit down on benches, just like you are now, and tell us stories. And then later on, when he retired from that, his son would do the same, his son John Fadden. And sometimes John's sons would tell stories there at the Six Nations Museum. It's located in Anchayota, New York, in the Adirondacks. So thanks to Ray, one of our respected elders, we still have our stories and our traditions and our history to pass down to anybody who's interested, to our young people, to Native people, to non-Native people, anybody that wants to hear them. So thank you for bringing this with you so that we could see a picture of Uncle Ray. He's 93 years old now and uh, lives up at Al-Kazasmi.